Hi, I'm uh, Scott Lehman, and today I'm going to be talking about the future of HoloLens development. Uh, just for my interest, who here has done some development for the HoloLens in the past? OK. Uh, what about uh, mobile AR or, or, or VR? OK, a few more hands. Well, a lot of the, the concepts and a lot of the tools are, are relevant, so you'll probably uh, get a lot from, from this talk as well, or be able to apply your existing experience to this talk. What I want everyone to get out of uh, the talk is to learn about uh, the whole lens too, learn about its features and what it can do, uh, and be able to get started now, be able to know about the tools and be able to get started tonight on developing for the whole lens too, even if you don't have the hardware, uh, and also to get a little bit inspired about uh, mixed reality devices and the future of mixed reality. A little bit about me, I'm uh, originally from Australia. I was born uh, down the bottom of Australia in Tasmania. Uh, and I studied games development, and then I've gone into IT consulting. And so I've tried to take my game dev uh, background and apply it into IT consulting. So I've done a lot of work with natural user interface devices, like the original uh, Connect for Xbox and Connect for Windows, and also VR devices like the original Oculus Rift. Uh, and as of uh, 2015, I moved to Seattle and was lucky enough to get some early exposure, early access to the whole lens before it was released. Uh, and I've been working with the whole lens ever since uh, the last two years here in Norway as the Mixed Reality lead for Sopra Stereo. Uh, the Mixed Reality team on Sopra Stereo has gotten a lot of use out of the HoloLens, uh, the original HoloLens, uh, but we also use other Mixed Reality devices uh, like mobile AR, uh, VR devices, and other wearable uh, Mixed Reality devices when, um, when appropriate. But we've gotten a lot of value out of the original HoloLens, so we're really excited about the, the HoloLens too. So when I talk about mixed reality, uh, myself as the mixed reality lead or the mixed reality team, I'm talking about mixed reality as a spectrum uh, between the physical world and the digital world. Uh, so on one side of that spectrum being augmented reality, where you're taking the real world and adding in digital objects to it, or virtual reality, where you're taking a digital world and pulling some information from the real world, such as your head position or your hand position, or maybe uh, objects that you're about to run into. Uh, so this is the mixed reality spectrum. Uh, and the whole lens 2 is on the augmented reality side. It's a wearable augmented reality device. And the purpose of mixed reality is to give people superpowers, to give the users that are using it the ability to extend their ability to do things in the real world. Uh, so you can give them x-ray vision by allowing surgeons to see inside the body or people on the construction site to be able to see uh, within the walls to see hidden structures. You can use it to travel through time to see the future, how is this area going to be affected by a new building or a new uh, train station in the area. Uh, and you can use it to teleport people, to allow them to collaborate together without physically traveling. Uh, this is an example of uh, one of the projects at Sopra Steria, where we're using mixed reality for planning of infant heart surgeries. <clears throat> and normally when you're, you're doing um, uh, planning for these types of surgeries, the doctors look at these 2D screens where they have the CT or the MRI images, and they're making their own subjective 3D image in their head. So it's like looking at, uh, you know, when you look at IKEA instructions, you're looking at these 2D images and you're making a 3D representation in your head. And the problem with that is they are not always identical. So you've got your own subjective image that doesn't necessarily line up with other people's. Uh, but here, by using the whole lens, we can have four different surgeons looking at the same 3D object, the same hologram, and have one objective truth that they can agree on and they can use for planning. They can say, this is the situation with the heart, and this is the approach we're going to take. Uh, and so the value of that is be able to avoid mistakes and to have faster planning time. And this is a video of it in action. So far, and to the best of my knowledge, uh, we are the first center to use the Microsoft HoloLens for planning heart operations in children. Uh, we have been using 3D prints for some years for this purpose to get the 3D experience to plan these operations. But the HoloLens seems to give us a lot more in terms of sharing, interaction and dynamics uh, uh, of the models that we use for this planning. It's often said that a good image saves a thousand words. I think that a good hologram may save a thousand images. Uh, 
and this is a, a more detail on the uh, on the application where this is a, where they're using uh, the whole lens for planning uh, to for to putting a patch in the heart. So this is a uh, a scaled up infant heart where there's, the child's being born with a, a hole in its heart that is stopping the normal circular flow without the within the heart. So it needs to be needs to be repaired by putting in a patch. Um, and here the surgeons sheared off the, the, the front of the heart so they can see the internal structures and they're planning where to place this, uh, this green patch within the heart to fix that hole. Um, and that uh, patch that they're laying out will be 3D printed out to create a mold. They can put a, a Gore-Tex patch over and cut out the patch to use for the surgery. Uh, so now they're able to manipulate that patch using their hands uh, and manipulate the, the heart in order to get uh, the right position for, for that patch. Uh, and that's incredibly important because you don't want to make adjustments during the surgery. And this is another application designed for orthopedic surgery. Uh, and this is for giving orthopedic surgeons x-ray vision. And this is something that every orthopedic surgeon in the world wants. Uh, they want to be able to see the bones within the body. Uh, so here we've got a, a medical tracking camera that's tracking this, uh, some markers on the leg. And then we're visualizing that bone using the whole lens, the original whole lens. Uh, and in photos and in videos, it can look like the bone is on top of the leg. But if you're wearing the whole lens, you've got that depth perception so that you can see that the bone is embedded within the leg. Uh, so the surgeon is able to move uh, the leg, see the bone move, see uh, if there's pain, where there's problems, see the range of movement for that bone. And so this, this is something that orthopedic surgeons are very excited about. This is the original whole lens uh, that came out uh, over three years ago. Uh, it's a wearable computer. It doesn't plug into uh, your phone. It doesn't plug into anything else. It's a computer you wear on your head. Uh, and it's been an amazing device. It's got a transparent display. So when you put it on, you're still looking at the real world. You can still see people, talk to people. It's not like a, a VR device. Um, so it's, amaz it's uh, capable of amazing things. Um, but it's recently been uh, announced. Microsoft has announced its success of the whole lens too. So this was announced in February this year. Uh, it's launching this year, and this is a, a huge improvement over the capabilities of the the whole lens one. Uh, increasing of the, the the performance of the device, but also adding some new functionality. And uh, it's really been a, a surprise to see how much it's improved in just three years. It's a huge uh, leap ahead in terms of what is possible. Uh, probably one of the Things that is most easy to underestimate is the improvements in, in comfort. With the original whole lens, it's a, a device that you wear for, for maybe an hour at a time, and then it starts to feel uncomfortable. Um, but by taking some of the weight and shifting it to the back and having it more balanced on the head, uh, you're able to wear the whole lens too for, for you know, up to three hours at a time uh, before it starts to feel uncomfortable. So it's changed uh, the use cases where it can be used by extending the, the periods where it's comfortable. Uh, and it's also an easier uh, device to take on and off. Uh, and you can also tilt up the display here. You can tilt up the front visor. Uh, and that's useful for surgeons if they want to uh, toggle between looking directly at the, the patient or looking and seeing the holograms in their field of view. It's useful for social interactions. You, know, you can see through the visor, and you can see people's eyes through the visor, but it's a little bit like wearing sunglasses. You don't always want that in front of your eyes if you're talking to someone. So you can tilt it up. And it's great for development as well, because you can sit at your computer with the visor up, deploy to your device, and just tilt it down. You don't have to worry about taking it on and off. Uh, so it's got a transparent display like the whole lens one, uh, but they've extended the field of view. They've kept the details. So it's a high precision, uh, high detail display. So you can read text comfortably. It's not like a, a VR headset, which maybe spreads out the detail across a wide field of view. It's designed to have a, a higher level of detail in the center of your vision. Uh, and they optimize the position of the, the holograms uh, specifically to your 3D eye position. So whether your eyes are further apart or closer together or further back from the display, they track your eyes in 3D and they're able to optimize. So the hologram will always see uh, appear in the same spot for you as it will for another user with a different eye position. One of the criticisms that the first HoloLens got was the, the field of view. Uh, so the HoloLens 1 has got a holographic frame uh, in which holograms appear. If you move that holographic frame away uh, and holograms move outside of the holographic frame, you won't be able to see them anymore. So you can't see holograms on the periphery of your vision outside this field of view. 
uh, and the whole lens too is extended uh, uh, that field of view um, from 33, 34 degrees uh, diagonally to 52. Uh, and what that means is that the surface area is more than doubled. So you've got more than double the, uh, the pixels that you can see holograms with. Um, and what that means is that you can look at bigger holograms without them being cut off on the top and bottom of the sides. You can look at more holograms at the same time, but also means you can get closer to holograms uh, without them being cut off. Uh, and the HoloLens 2 has got its own custom holographic processing unit. Uh, and this is used to do all the computing tasks that your, your laptop doesn't need to do. So the, the HoloLens 2 needs to track itself as it moves around space, it needs to track your hand movements. And so it uses that holographic processing unit to crunch all the data from all its sensors to get an image of the world and to get an image of what you're doing. And it's got a lot of sensors. It's got eight cameras uh, on the HoloLens 2, four environmental tracking cameras that are looking for points in the environment uh, to do real-time slam processing to work out how you're moving through the world. It's got a color video camera so that you can stream your perspective and do uh, image detection. And it's got a, a time of flight uh, depth camera to pick up your hand movements, to track your hands in 3D. It also has two eye tracking uh, cameras to track your eyes and an IMU, which is an accelerometer gyroscope and magnometer unit to track the orientation of your head uh, and a five microphone array. So it's using all that data to work out how you're moving through space and it's using the microphone array to pick up your voice rather than anyone else's voice. So if you have a, a friend in the room and they yell out a voice command, if they're not within one meter of the device, it'll be ignored because the five microphones can determine where the voice is coming from. And with the depth sensor, it uses a miniaturized uh, depth, the same uh, depth sensor from the Azure Connect, but miniaturized. Uh, the Azure Connect is a, a separate hardware device that's coming out this month. Uh, and what it, what it is, is basically a collection of sensors, many of the same sensors from the whole lens, uh, that's uh, embedded in a device that you can attach to a computer uh, to put it in certain environments or attach to objects, uh, attach to vehicles or, or robots in order to sense things about the world. Um, so it senses, it's used to uh, measure or track uh, or capture uh, things about the environment or objects in the environment or people in the environment for industrial uses. And it's got a time of flight depth sensor, which means that it can pick out pixels from the world and tell you what depth they are. So it can track objects in 3D. This is a video of that in, in action where it's, each of these points is a parent that's being tracked in 3D. So you can see the, the detail on this, uh, on this jumper and the detail on the hands. Uh, this is the same camera that the whole lens 2 uses to track the position of your hands in 3D space. So it can work out your, your hand positions. And then Microsoft has taken that data, taken the, the data of many different people's hands, uh, hand shapes and hand sizes, and used machine learning to work out how to calculate the, the position of people's fingers in space based on that data. And then they run that data on the AI coprocessor on the HPU in order to be able to track uh, your hands in real time. So you've got articulated hand tracking, which you can use to control holograms. And so this is a example of that hand tracking, where it's detecting your hands and detecting uh, the movements in real time. And it's 21 points of uh, articulation on your hands, each hand. <clears throat> and it uses that ability uh, to allow you to reach out and touch holograms and interact with holograms with your hands directly. Uh, and it doesn't just work in um, promotional videos, it works in real life. It's really good hand tracking. I've used hand tracking before with VR headsets uh, and it's always been interesting, but not reliable. But the, rel the hand tracking for uh, the whole lens too is, is really reliable and uh, really amazing. Uh, so you can use it for, for buttons as well. Obviously you're not getting uh, haptic or tactical feedback, but you can give feedback uh, visually and, and with sound uh, and so it's, very, it's a very satisfying interaction to, uh, to touch holographic buttons on the HoloLens too. And you can also have more ambitious uh, interactions, such as a holographic piano. <laughs> it probably won't replace uh, real pianos, though. Um, so some of the interactions that are possible uh, on the HoloLens too is being able to touch uh, holograms. Uh, and detect those touches, whether it's a button or an object. 
You can manipulate objects directly, holograms. You can grab them with one hand. You can grab them with two hands and then rotate or resize. Uh, and you can also potentially grab objects from far away. You can shoot a ray out from your hand and grab from a distance, manipulate from a distance, so you don't have to walk over it. Uh, and you can use interactions uh, in conjunction with your eye gaze as well. Since it's got those eye tracking cameras, you can look at an object and say a voice command and have that voice command applied to that object that you're looking at. And this is in contrast to the old way of controlling the HoloLens 1. So these are uh, the interactions for the original HoloLens. It didn't have eye tracking, but it had uh, the, the IMU to track your head direction. So you'd move your head around a little bit like a cursor, kind of pointing at things with your nose. And then to select, you'd use the air tap gesture. And to go home, you'd use Bloom. Uh, and some of the problems with these gestures is that you'd have to learn them. The user would have to learn them. Uh, it takes time to, le uh, to learn them. They're not foolproof. And you might accidentally do them as well. If you're talking and have a conversation with someone, you might be triggering that go home uh, command just talking. So these are gestures you have to learn and gestures that could be uh, accidentally misused. And so with the whole lens too, they're moving away from these symbolic gestures to using things that are more instinctual, you know, things that you know how to do anyhow. You know how to reach out and touch a button. You know how to grab something and move it about. So they're moving away from these symbolic gestures to things that are more skeuomorphic, more like the things that you do in real life. So you can just apply the knowledge you already have uh, to use holograms. It also has a retinal sign-in, so you can put on the device, recognize it's your eyes, recognize it's it you, and signs you into Windows Hello. Uh, and it has quite accurate eye tracking. Um, I've had problems with eye tracking before because I wear glasses and it's caused interference. But the eye tracking really works well, even with glasses uh, on the whole lens too. And it's really, uh, it's hard to demonstrate in a video. It's like you've got to try on for yourself. Um, but when you're looking at, say, if you're reading a paragraph of text, once you get to the bottom of the, the page, you can start scrolling automatically. So you get this feeling like the device is, is reading your mind because it's responding uh, to what you're doing in real time. And this is an example of, <clears throat> of that functionality of uh, the device automatically being able to scroll content based on where you're looking. It's hard to see, but it's, uh, it's really impressive. Um, so what's the point of building an application for a whole lens too? What's, what is it good at that you can't do on mobile phones or or, or VR or, or other platforms. Uh, it's really good for visualizing things in 3D. So if you have data that is innately 3D that has value in being shown in 3D, uh, then it's a great device for that. You know, the human body is in 3D. So if you're visualizing things like this, this is a, a liver uh, with different structures within the liver, including a, a tumor that needs to be removed. There's value in seeing that in 3D because that is a 3D thing. That's a thing that is 3D in real life. So there's value in not flattening that down to a still image or to a video. You can get uh, value from seeing that depth. Uh, it's also good for visualizing things when you want to keep your hands free. You know, if you're doing some task that involves using your hands, uh, such as taking apart a valve, uh, you want to use your hands. You want to use tools. And so it's a great way to, to see instructions while keeping your hands free so you don't have to use a tablet or a phone. Uh, you can just see the, the holograms telling you exactly what to do uh, while keeping your hands free. And it's great for syncing things up with the real world. Uh, so putting things on a, on a building site to visualize things that haven't been built yet or comparing how it was built to how it was meant to be built or showing hidden structures within the walls, uh, that's a great use. Or, or showing hidden structures within the human body. Uh, that's a great way, uh, a great use of the devices to give people x-ray vision. And you can also use it for collaboration, to have multiple people in the same place looking at the same hologram uh, at the same time. Uh, and this is the sort of... You could do a similar collaboration in, in VR, uh, but the, some of the downsides with VR is that you're socially isolated. Uh, so you put on a VR headset and you cut off from the real world. Well, if you have a collaboration like this, because you can still see each other, you can still talk to each other uh, and have a, a social conversation uh, without being cut out uh, from the real world. So you can have conversations like this uh, on tabletop scale. You can scale it up to Godzilla scale as well uh, and have a conversation within the middle of a city, for example are useful for, for city planning or planning a rampage. And you can also use it for uh, sharing your perspective with other people that are remote. So you, it's got this, uh, this color video camera that you can use to, to stream your perspective and say, this is what I'm looking at. This is what I'm doing. Can you help me? And you can have someone uh, working remotely using another type of device, annotating your world, drawing arrows and instructions and sending files and images into your world to help you complete a task. 
But to do all these things, to, to do good, uh, good mixed reality projects for, for the HoloLens 2, there's things you need. You need data that is meaningful to show in 3D. Uh, you, if you want to sync things up with the, the real world, then you need the, that data. For a construction site, you need the, the BIM models, the building models in order to sync up. Uh, and you need to work out the best way to sync them up as well. And you need design, uh, because with the HoloLens 2, it's a new way of interacting with computers. It's not something where there's a lot of standards uh, or known design patterns that you can fall back on. So you need to have design as an active part of the development process. Uh, it's not something you can, uh, can ignore. Both user experience design, in terms of designing how the experience is going to be used, the application is going to be used, but also service design, to understand how it's going to be used outside of just uh, the user interface, because these applications are going to be used as part of people's work. You know, they're not just going to be used at a desktop in an office. They're going to be used in real locations like a construction site or an operating room. And maybe on the construction, uh, on the operating room, you've got to worry about um, how the surgeon's going to put on uh, and take off the whole lens too. You've got to worry about the lighting. If the lighting's too bright, maybe the holograms will get washed out. If they're using it on a construction site, maybe it's too dark. And if the holograms are too bright, it might ruin their, their night vision. And so you've got to have access to the environments where it's going to be used and access to the people that are going to be using it in order to make good applications. So what are the tools? What are the tools for, for uh, HoloLens 2 development? You've got a few options. Uh, you've got uh, the Unity game engine. You've got the Unreal game engine. Uh, or you could build your own engine on top of uh, DirectX. I'm not going to talk about DirectX too much, because uh, it's a big subject. But if you're going the DirectX route, it's going to take a lot more work, because uh, there's a lot less resources available to you. And you're going to have to do a lot of the work uh, that's already been done for Unreal and particularly for Unity. Um, but maybe if you've got some, an engine uh, built already, if you've got some specific performance goals, that might be uh, the way you want to go. But for, <clears throat> for most use cases, Unity uh, is probably the best, uh, the most popular choice. I think 90% of HoloLens 1 applications were built using Unity. It's a very popular choice with a lot of documentation and community and so forth. Uh, and Unreal is a relatively new choice. It was barely supported for HoloLens 1, uh, as in you could deploy some things using the Unreal Engine to the HoloLens 1, but it wasn't really supported. But now, for HoloLens 2, Epic is throwing uh, their support behind Unreal for the HoloLens 2. Um, and the Unreal, <coughs> the Unreal Engine is a, a multi-platform game engine. Uh, it's got a reputation for high-fidelity graphics. Uh, and when you're, when you're using it, you're either writing C++ code or Blueprint which is a visual scripting language uh, where you move around nodes in order to control behaviors. They added HoloLens support, tentative HoloLens support in May this year, but it's not being, going to be included uh, officially in the official releases until August. Uh, this is the Unreal Editor. This is Blueprint, the, the node-based visual scripting language that you can use. Uh, but if you, if you want to start uh, playing around with this, it's not part of the, engine, the official releases of the engine yet. So you've got to uh, create an Epic account, link that to your GitHub account, and then pull down, um, pull down a branch, the dev VR HoloLens 2 branch, and build the engine yourself on your machine. So you've got to pull down that branch and build it. This took about half an hour on my machine to, to build the engine. So it's not, it's not so small. You've got to add a whole lens plugin, and then you can build packages that can be deployed to the whole lens too. There's not a lot of documentation available uh, for the Unreal Engine for whole lens development to development right now, so it's it's very early. There's an example project available uh, at this uh, URL. Where you can see uh, a project that Epic has made for that engine, um, but there's not going to be a lot of <clears throat> support or documentation until August when it's part of the official release. That's when you'll be able to just download the Unreal Engine itself and not have to download the source and build it. Uh, Unity uh, is a, uh, a more reliable option, you could say, since it's had such uh, support for the HoloLens 1, a lot of support from Unity, a lot of support from Microsoft. Most of the documentation from Microsoft for HoloLens 1 uses Unity examples. And if you're using Unity, you're using Unity, Visual Studio, and you're writing C-sharp code. Uh, and you can also optionally use this mixed reality toolkit for Unity, which I'll, I'll come back to. Uh, so this is what you need uh, in order to, to build for HoloLens 2 using Unity. You need Windows 10, 
this version of the Windows 10 SDK, you need either version 2018.3 or 2019. Point something in order to build for the HoloLens 2. Um, the main advantage of using 2019 is that you can build for ARM 64, which will give you some performance increases. Using, got to use either Visual Studio 2017 or 2019. You've either got to have the hardware or there's a whole lens 2 emulator that runs on Hyper-V. Uh, this is the Unity editor. You've got a collection of objects in your scene, a hierarchy of those objects, uh, all your project files, and then an expector so the, on, the, on the right side so that you can see all the, the details of objects in your scene. And this is what you'll be doing when you're writing code. You'll be writing C Sharp code. This is an example blank mono behavior script, uh, which is one of the uh, behaviors that you can add to an object. Uh, the start function will be called whenever the object uh, that you attach the script to is created. And you have this update function uh, that is called every frame. Uh, but it's just normal C Sharp code, so you don't have to be uh, particularly familiar with or, or comfortable with 3D concepts in order to start coding using Unity. And then to deploy, you build uh, from Unity to Visual Studio, and then deploy from there to either the HoloLens emulator <clears throat> on x86 or 64, or you build for ARM and deploy for the HoloLens 2. Uh, there's going to be an option in the future to use holographic remoting. <clears throat> and that's where you actually run the application on your laptop, on your development laptop, and stream it to the HoloLens 2. So you're sending a video stream and taking all the input from the HoloLens and sending that back to your laptop. So you're running on your laptop, uh, but you're getting the experience of using it on the HoloLens 2. That's not supported yet for the HoloLens 2, but it is supported for the HoloLens 1. Uh, and it can be a great way to, to speed up development to test out your application without having to take the time to deploy. <clears throat> so the Mixerati toolkit. This is a, a toolkit that was started by Microsoft and has gotten a lot of uh, support and involvement from the community. Uh, and it's basically a, a collection of uh, building blocks, examples, uh, control prefabs that can help you to build a uh, whole lens 2 application. Uh, it's not just for the, the whole lens 2, it's also for the whole lens 1 and for Windows mixed reality headsets, <coughs> VR headsets, and other VR headsets like the HTC Vive and the Oculus Rift. Uh, so it's a bunch of controls and building blocks that you can use for all these types of applications, uh, but it's useful for whole lens 2 as well. And once you add uh, that toolkit to uh, your Unity project, you'll get a Mixed Reality Toolkit object, uh, and you'll get this uh, collection of uh, profiles. And this is where you uh, set uh, which services you want to use from the Mixed Reality Toolkit and how they should be configured. So you've got these uh, configurations, these profiles around the experience, around the input. Uh, you've got boundary and teleport for, for VR applications, so you can you can just ignore those for, for HoloLens 2. Uh, and you've got other uh, sub profiles for all these settings. So there's many details, uh, levels of detail for configuration that you can use uh, to configure how you want to use the toolkit. And this is an example of that. This is the di diagnostics uh, system settings, the profile for that. And that uh, determines if you want to do diagnostics uh, and show this diagnostics, this frame counter control uh, during your, for, uh, in your application. This is a frame counter, so this visualizes when you have frame drops. So if you drop below uh, 60 frames per second, it'll visualize that. And that's really important on HoloLens 2 because if it goes below 60 frames per second, you'll feel it. The holograms will feel less stable. You'll see them, you know, they're not anchored in space. They're, they're a little bit laggy or, or shaky. Um, so that's worth a very useful tool. Here's some examples of, of uh, the control free preps, some of the control free preps that are available in uh, in the Mixed Reality Toolkit. Uh, this is examples of uh, controls that allow press interactions. So it comes with a number of buttons that you can, uh, that you can use. And also as examples of how to visualize your hand mesh. Um, so when you record videos on the whole lens too, there's a little bit of a video offset. So the holograms won't look like they're exactly on top of the hands. But that's just an effect of the recording. That's not how it looks in real life. In real life, you'd see these uh, joint uh, visualizations and these meshes on top of the hands. But you've got some examples of how to visualize those hand meshes to the user, and you can customize or, or learn from them. 
uh, and also examples of how to directly manipulate holograms, how to reach out and, and stretch and, uh, and rotate uh, holograms directly with your, your hands. And they also have a bounding box example, uh, which is like direct manipulation, except it's, uh, the object is, is held within a box with affordances on the side, so you know exactly where to grab in order to rotate or, or resize it. So it's just giving visual hints to the user that this is an object that you can resize and rotate. Uh, and then it has examples for how you can do interactions at a far distance. You know, shooting a ray out of your hand in order to grab uh, and move objects. And it also has input simulation. Uh, you know, when you're working on your laptop, you don't have uh, access to do these gestures yourselves. Uh, so you're reliant on simulating these interactions using your, your mouse, your keyboard, uh, maybe a gamepad in order to test out these interactions. So they've got a input simulation system uh, where you can have a, a fake virtual hand uh, that you can control with your mouse uh, and keyboard in order to, to grab things uh, and, and test out those interactions. So you can use the mouse wheel to move the hand in and out, and then you can pinch and, and grab uh, elements within your scene. Uh, so obviously that's a bit stilted. It's not the same as using your hands. Uh, so our team has experimented with using the Leap Motion uh, the device. Uh, and the Leap Motion is a IR camera that does hand tracking. Uh, it doesn't do uh, hand tracking with the same fidelity as the HoloLens 2, but it's a good way to simulate it on your laptop to try out those hand interactions before you deploy to the device. So we can use those tracked motions uh, on our development laptops to try out interactions. This is the architecture of the Mixed Toolkit. We've got a number of prefabs, like those control prefabs I showed off. You've got a number of services, like the input service and input simulation services. And they all run on this Mixed Toolkit object runtime, which is in your, your scene in Unity, uh, which pulls all your configuration from these Mixed TK uh, profiles to uh, configure what services you want to use and how you want to use them. Uh, and then it also has some utilities, which are largely <coughs> independent from the services. And uh, they've just uh, updated the Mixed Toolkit back in April uh, to add in HoloLens 2 support and also to, to bundle the Mixed Toolkit into different packages. So you've got the core foundation, which has got all the core services, and then you've got some extensions and experimental uh, packages that you can use as well, optimally, uh, optionally, uh, such as the light estimation service. Uh, and this is a service which allows you to take photos of the environment uh, in your application on the HoloLens 2 in order to sample uh, the light sources to calculate where the light sources should appear for holograms uh, in your application. So here it's calculating that there is a light source up uh, and behind these objects. Uh, and here it is in, uh, in practice where it's taking all these background photos and working out that the light sources should be above, uh, above these, these models. If you're interested in learning more about HoloLens 2 development uh, and the tools, uh, Microsoft has put all their official documentation and uh, the tools and, and resources, including the HoloLens 2 emulator, under this URL, aka.ms mr, uh, mr for mixed reality. And Within uh, that webpage, they have uh, a documentation section about all the design and development documentation. They have a, a small section within there called Tutorials and Sample Apps. And that's where all the example uh, whole lens two applications from, from Microsoft uh, reside. So they're kind of buried a little bit in there. So it's worth checking that out. If you want to talk to other uh, whole lens developers, uh, you can go to the Holo Developers Slack as well. Uh, and Microsoft has made a number of uh, Azure services that are useful for, for HoloLens 2 applications. They've got their standard cognitive services that are available to, to anyone uh, or any type of application, but they can be particularly useful for HoloLens 2. Uh, so you can use the vision service to detect objects 
in the room by looking for certain objects. You can use the, the speech service uh, to turn speech into text if you want to do dictation or if you want to do natural language uh, commands, you know, move. Uh, I want you to move that object over there and resize it and replace it with this. You can do that uh, sort of functionality by the speech uh, API. And you can do translation between languages as well. But they've also made some services that are specifically for mixed reality devices, uh, for the HoloLens 2, the HoloLens 1, uh, and also uh, mobile AR devices. Uh, they've got the Zero Digital Twins service, uh, which allows you to build up a digital twin of a particular environment or a particular object. And then you could use that in a HoloLens 2 app to, say, visualize that environment as a tabletop model and see all the sensor data and all the relationship between those data points. Or you could use it in the location to see data, uh, data, da uh, sensor data visualized uh, around you according to your context. Uh, they've got the Zero Remote Rendering Service, which is in private preview at the moment, so it's not out. Uh, but that's a service where you render high detail models, uh, high polygon models in the cloud in Azure, and then send a video stream uh, to the whole lens too. So it's designed for uh, models that are too, too, too uh, high detail to be visualized on the device itself. Uh, and they've also uh, released Azure Spatial Anchors, uh, which is a way to uh, have a, a, holen a hologram shared at the same position uh, between multiple devices, uh, including uh, devices of multiple types, so cross-platform sharing of holograms. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So normally, uh, with the HoloLens and the HoloLens 2, you anchor holograms in the, in the real world by doing uh, a spatial processing. Uh, and you do a spatial processing of the, the room around you uh, to work out how the HoloLens 2 is being moved about as you move your head and as you move around the room. And so you develop a spatial mesh that looks something like this. This is from the, the HoloLens 1. So this is how the HoloLens uh, sees the room. It has this mesh. It can recognize uh, as you move around the room. If you put a, a hologram on the table and leave the room and come back, it'll recognize the room again, recognize where that hologram should be, and put it back on the table. Uh, one problem with this is it's very local. It's local to that whole lens. It's local to that device. So if I have another user with another device, I've got to work out how to share that position with him. Uh, and it's very, uh, it's not going to be done the same way on a, a mobile device, an AR core or AR kit device. So I've got to work out how can I translate between the different ways of anchoring things in space. Another way to anchor things is using fiducial markers, uh, high contrast image markers that the, the whole lens 2 can recognize and then show content relative to those markers, such as showing a hologram around this, uh, this uh, barometer meter here. Uh, problem with that is that you have to have these physical image markers in your environment. Uh, so that's not always convenient as well. So as your spatial anchors attempts to, uh, to solve this problem, to allow you to have come into a space, create an anchor, um, I'll come back to the, the anchors, and then anchor content relative to that position. And they're allowing you to do it for uh, different types of devices. So for HoloLens 2, for HoloLens 1, for AR Core, uh, and AR Kit mobile devices as well. So they can all look at the hol same hologram in the same place. And it does that by having a user create a, <clears throat> a unique visual fingerprint of an area, uh, and then have a, a hologram anchored relative to that. So one user will come into this space, they'll place an anchor, they'll move a hologram about, and then later on, another user will come using another device like the HoloLens 2. They'll recognize that space based on that fingerprint, and then that hologram will appear in the same place. And it creates these anchorings uh, as your spatial anchors by doing visual processing uh, of the space. Uh, so it looks for uh, feature points, which are high contrast areas in the room. So maybe the edges of tables or high color contrast between um, Parts, uh, parts in the room. So this is a, a sculptor from one of the Microsoft offices. And these are the feature points that are generated from, uh, from that space. So you can see on the chair where they've got edges, uh, it collects a lot of feature points, and on the sculpture as well. So I can go into this space, generate those feature sets, create a Azure Spatial Anchor, and say all my content in this room should be relative to this point. We've got all these feature points. Here's an anchor point relative to those feature points. And now I want to have content relative to that anchor. And then I can share that anchor with another user and have them see the holograms in the same spot. And you can join them together. You can have multiple anchors linked together. 
So if you spot one anchor, you can say, okay, I know relative to this anchor, there should be another anchor 10 meters that way. Uh, and by linking them together, you can get mappings, huge mappings of internal spaces. So this is a visualization from Microsoft from one of their buildings where they've taken multiple whole lenses and walked through the whole building to get this uh, huge internal map uh, of their building where they can anchor content and have that appear on, on any device. And you can use that for a lot of things. So you can have multiple different types of devices, tablets, phones, whole lenses, looking at the same holograms in the same point without having to rely on uh, traditional markers. And you can use it for things like indoor navigation as well because you've mapped out these internal spaces. So you know where you are uh, within those, uh, those spaces and anchor content within them. Uh, so you can use it for a kind of internal GPS for indoor navigation. Uh, to say, I need to get to here, what's the best way to get there? Or you can find particular assets within the building, or you can do things like uh, set up zones where, where they should be uh, warned about, okay, this is a dangerous zone. And Microsoft is planning to, uh, to use Azure Spatial Anchors uh, themselves for Minecraft Earth, uh, which is their uh, unreleased uh, AR uh, mobile game or application, sort of similar to, to Pokemon Go, where they'll allow you to build Minecraft structures in the real world and be able to anchor them in the real world with better than GPS uh, accuracy. So you'll be able to go to a public park and say, oh, okay, I want to build a treehouse. I build it here. And then I say to my friend, okay, I want you to be able to see this structure that I've built. Uh, here's my anchor. You can come to that place and you'll see the, the same structure in the same point. And you can even help build that structure with me. Uh, so they're really putting this technology to the test, or will be putting this technology to the test when this is eventually released. If you're interested in trying it out yourself, uh, it's in preview, so it's free. You can just sign into the Azure portal, uh, create a Azure uh, Spatial Anchor service, uh, and then test it out. And they've got some tutorials about, uh, about how to use it as well. This is the basics of, uh, of how to use it. You place an anchor by creating a a cloud spatial anchor session, and then you create a, a native anchor. So whether you're on the whole lens 2 or whole lens 1 or an AR core or AR kit mobile device, they've each got their own individual ways of anchoring things in space. So you just do it how you normally would, use the native way of anchoring. So for the whole lens 1, for example, it uses that spatial mesh and it creates an anchor that is about 30 megabytes uh, of data. So that's very uh, not so easy to share. So it takes that data and it crunches it down into a cloud special anchor, which is about three meg of data, and then is able to upload that to the cloud. And once it's uploaded, you get an ID back. Uh, and that ID is very important because you have to use that ID in order to find that anchor again. So you've got to work out the best way to, to share that ID with other users. And you can set a, uh, some quality control on that anchor. You know, if you just uh, put on the whole lens two and stare at a blank wall and say, okay, this is where I want to anchor content, it's not going to be a very good uh, collection of feature feature points. Uh, so it's going to be hard for other users to find it. So you can set some quality control so that the user has to look around in order to gather enough feature points uh, in order to, to make that a good anchor, uh, and then wait for uploading until that's ready. You can set properties on the anchor, and you can set an expiration date for the anchor as well. Because as people, as environments change, as people move around furniture, those anchor points are going to get less and less uh, reliable. And then once you're ready to look for the anchors, you set a search criteria, and you pass in the anchors that you want to look for. Uh, and it's a maximum of 10. So you've got to work out how to get those IDs from the, the user that created the anchor to the users that are going to be looking for it. Uh, and then once you're looking for it, you'll get these anchor-located events firing once you've found it. So you can imagine in the future, if you're, say, renting a, an apartment on Airbnb, the owner of that apartment uh, might create a uh, Azure Spatial Anchor uh, for their apartment, linked to a GPS uh, coordinate. And then once you get to the apartment, uh, your phone knows that you're in this particular location, so you can start looking for these specific uh, anchors and then show you content relative to that apartment. Okay, this is how the refrigerator works. This is um, some problems you have to look out for. Using GPS in that way is one way to, to, to handle how to share those Azure anchor IDs. Uh, so that's possible on mobile, but on the whole end too, there is no GPS. So you've got to think out another way, maybe using Wi-Fi positioning uh, or other sessions between users to share those ideas. Uh, so to sum up, 
the tools that are available for HoloLens 2 development. Uh, you've got Unity, uh, which has been the most popular option for HoloLens 1 development, at least, and it's a very reliable option. You've got Unreal, which is adding support now. Uh, we'll get full support in, in August. Or you can make your own, uh, build your own engine on top of DirectX. Uh, you've got the Mixed Reality Toolkit available to you if you're using Unity. Uh, Apparently, they're in the process of migrating or uh, making that available for Unreal as well, but that's not available yet. Uh, and you've got some mixed reality services, such as the Azure Spatial Anchor System, to help you extend your HoloLens 2 apps as well. Looking ahead into the, uh, the future a little bit, we've got the HoloLens 2 that's been announced but isn't released yet. It's coming out uh, this, this year. Uh, it's got some uh, incredible uh, processing power and sensors available to it. So it's going to be interesting to see how uh, people put that to the test. It hasn't really been uh, stretched to its limit yet. And it's going to be interesting how it's used with other devices like the Azure, uh, Azure Connect uh, to allow you to see uh, remote data uh, from those units. Uh, and also, eventually, the Azure remote rendering service is going to come out uh, to allow you to see uh, these incredibly high detailed, high poly models uh, streamed from Azure onto the device. Uh, the HoloLens 1 and the HoloLens 2 are both enterprise devices, um, but there are some consumer devices, uh, mixed reality devices available. The Magic Leap 1 came out last year uh, in the States. It's still only available in the States. And that is a device similar to the first HoloLens, except with a slightly higher field of view, and it moves some of the processing and battery to a, a belt unit. Uh, which makes it inappropriate for some uh, industrial work environments. And it's got an external hand controller, so you can use that to play games. And that's designed for consumers. So it's designed for, for fun, for entertainment, for art. Um, it hasn't uh, caught the world on fire yet, but it's, it's not going to remain alone for, for long. You know, Facebook is, is doing their own research. Apple is doing their own research. So there's going to be more and more consumer-focused uh, MR devices available in the future. But for now, it's, it's mostly for, uh, for industrial use, for enterprise use. And these are the 10 countries uh, where the HoloLens 2 will be available this year in the first wave. Uh, unfortunately, Norway isn't on that list, so it's, it's not yet known uh, when it'll be coming here. Looking at a, a little broader, uh, mixed reality is dependent uh, on this capability of computers to understand the world. So it uses machine learning to understand the movements of people's hands and what they intend when they move in their hands. It uses machine learning to understand uh, their voice and to have natural language uh, processing. Uh, and this ability, uh, or the capability of mixed reality applications will be extended uh, as this capability uh, for computers to understand the world grows and grows. Uh, so if you, if you think now of uh, the, the whole lens 2 has got uh, capabilities to understand the room, that could be extended as it gets to know more and more about the context. You know, am I in a meeting room right now, or am I on the construction site? Am I alone in this room, or is there many people? Is someone talking to me? Uh, so it can pick up on, on social cues. So as it gets more and more understanding of the world around it, uh, there's going to be more and more uh, possibilities for what you can do with mixed reality devices like the HoloLens 2. This is a, <clears throat> an old uh, video from Microsoft Research showing off something they call holoportation. And this is using the HoloLens 1, uh, an array of depth sensors around this user in this room. Uh, this is a manager from Microsoft Research. And his daughter is in a similar room with a similar setup. And they're going to have a, 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 a conversation using, using holograms. My daughter is stood in a similar capture rig somewhere else in our lab. And she's going to holoport into my space. And I'm going to interact with her wearing my HoloLens. Hi, Baba. Hey, Lily, I miss you too. Are you coming home? I'm coming home very soon. Let me get out of your way. Hey, Lilia, you can only hear me. You can't see me. But what are these toys? I have toys to, to show you. This one is named is Elmo. Elmo? He can sing. He oh. can sing. So that video is from three years ago and, and using the HoloLens 1, but I think it's relevant to, to show now because that capability, uh, you know, this, this setup uh, was a very experimental, very expensive setup. But that capability to capture, uh, capture spaces in 3D and to capture people in 3D uh, is getting 
more and more democratic. The Azure Connect, uh, which I mentioned, is coming out uh, this month. Uh, and it has that ability to, to capture the world and has the ability to synchronize multiple devices together so you can get uh, 3D data from multiple angles to capture a large space or a large object or, or to capture people. So the ability to capture that data uh, is going to uh, very quickly be, be extended. And now we've also got the HoloLens 2, uh, which is more capable than the HoloLens 1 at, at showing and rendering that data as well. Um, so. Speaking more broadly, as, as more devices are capable of doing this sort of processing, they're capable of capturing things from the world, we're going to start to see 3D things uh, like objects and places and people become more portable. You know, the way we think of photos and video is very portable, very easy to share. It's going to start to be more portable or, or more easy to share things in 3D. If I've got a, a 3D object that I want to share with someone, I have to give them the 3D object or, or, or use a 3D printer. But in the future, I'll just be able to share that object in 3D capture it in 3D, and then have them be able to view it in 3D. If I want to capture this space, the experience of being in a place, I can capture that and share it with someone else. And also have it be able to capture people, like that whole portation example, and have a one-on-one -on -one, uh, conversation using mixed trial devices like the HoloLens 2 and the Azure Connect. And so it's going to be interesting to, uh, to see how, how it affects the people that grow up with this technology. Right now, we're at the stage where you know, this technology is, is coming up and evolving, but there's going to be a generation that grows up uh, with this technology and takes mixed reality for, for granted. You know, it's just another boring part of the world. Uh, and for, for us now, when we think about digital things, we're mainly talking about fake things behind glass, fake things on a screen. Uh, but how is it going to affect, uh, affect people who grow up where digital things are things that they more and more see as part of the world? They don't see it on a screen. They see it out in the world. Uh, this is a quote from a, a talk I love called Our Kids Are Going to Get Really Weird uh, from the, the CTO of Leap Motion, that hand tracking camera I, I showed before. And he's thinking about the future and thinking about the, the kids that grow up with this technology. And he says, he predicts uh, that kids might say, well, some parts of the world are made of atoms and waves and other parts are made of bits and bytes. That digital will just be another material in the world, the way we think of plastic or wood or, or metal as different materials, just different parts of the world. <clears throat> but we're still closer to this at this stage. Um, in terms of mixed reality, the, the devices are still, uh, they're still relatively expensive, relatively big, and relatively rare, and, and used primarily for work, uh, like, like early mobile phones were. Um, so it's worth taking that in stock, uh, but also to realize that things aren't going to stay like this forever. You know? Right now, uh, the devices are rare and, and expensive and, and useful work, but they're not going to stay like this forever. You know, they're going to iterate. They're going to get more and more uh, capable, uh, more and more cheaper and democratic, and more and more portable. Uh, so it's worth thinking about now, about how businesses are going to have to react, uh, and how developers are going to react, and, and get comfortable uh, with the tools and the concepts now, while we're still at this stage. Uh, if you're interested in working with the Mixed Reality team uh, at Subrest Area, please send me an email. We're always looking for, for talented developers and designers as well who want to work with the HoloLens too. Uh, if there's any questions, we've got a, a microphone that can come around. Is it in, in use in, in the oil industry anywhere, or are there any plans for it? Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, Equinor has, has talked publicly about their, their use of the, the HoloLens um, as part of their business. So they're definitely very uh, enthusiastic and have been working with, with that technology for a long time. And, and Supra Stereo is part of that work with them. Uh, and I know a lot of other oil companies are uh, at least exploring the space. Yeah, so that's a great that's a great use because oil you know oil platforms it, it's a very physical business it's very very three D so it's a great use of and of course people are using their hands they're using tools so having that capability to to visualize things in three D to sync things up with the 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 three D environments and the three D machines uh, and be able to work hands free uh, is a, it's a great match. Any examples on the internet where we can go and look at? Yeah, if you look on the Equinor Facebook page, they do have some um, 
some, some links and videos, uh, and also uh, some of their official blogs that have talked about um, their work with Hollands. Thank you. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Lars, I'm an NTNU student. I was uh, talking with a friend of mine uh, about augmented reality, and then he had this idea about, uh, wouldn't it be nice to have like a ghost of himself uh, running when he did it last time, and then he ah. can see if he's behind or in front of himself yeah. last time, or, or other people who have recorded their jogging trips or bicycling. Uh, when do you think that we will start to see this kind of technology when you can be physically active? Yeah, yeah, that's a great, uh, that's a great question. I, I think that's a great use case. Um, yeah, it would be inappropriate with the whole lens too, because you don't necessarily want to be jogging with uh, the whole lens too on your on your head. You could do it, uh, but um, yeah, it's a, it's a great question of when it'll become. Um, so the whole lens too is a is a work device. It's designed for being used for particular purposes for reasonably short period of time, you know, three hours or, or so. It's not a all day device. Um, so I'm not sure when there'll be devices that are you know, portable enough to be all day devices that you can wear comfortably and use for activities um, like that. I know a lot of people are, are trying, they're trying to miniaturize and, and make them um, smaller and, and more practical for those sorts of uses. So I don't know, maybe, maybe five years away, uh, I, I, I'm not sure. Um, I think a, a lot of companies are trying very hard to reach that point because you know, mixed reality right now, it's, it's useful for work. It's very useful for work, um, but it hasn't broken that, that barrier into, um, into consumer use yet. So it's gonna be a, a big industry when it happens. You, you talked about uh, gestures. Uh, are there any custom gestures you can add to it? Do you get the data from the hand so you can trigger? Yeah, absolutely. So you get the full hand mesh. So <clears throat> are there gestures? So they're trying to move away from gestures, as in the problem with gestures is that you have to learn them and you can screw them up. Um, so they don't necessarily, like, you get the hand mesh so you can do whatever you want. If you want to make your own gestures, if you want to go, OK, you make the peace sign and a menu pops up or you give the thumbs up uh, and something happens, you can definitely do that. You get the full mesh of the hand. So you can do whatever, um, whatever logic you want uh, on top of that. Um, but in terms of the, the gestures that are available now, so they still have the air tap in there. You don't need to use it, but it's still, um, still there from the whole lens one. Um, Bloom has been killed off because it, was, it misfires uh, so often. So what they've replaced Bloom with is having a, a palm up and a button will appear on your wrist and then you place the button, push the button on your wrist. So it's a much more foolproof uh, way of interacting. Um, but you're free to make whatever gestures you want because you get those full articulations of the hands. But I guess Microsoft's advice right now is to try to use the natural movements of the hand and, and not necessarily depend on the user having to learn a specific gesture. But I, I'm sure there are use cases where that's a good idea. Um, uh, so it's, it's definitely possible. Uh, another question, uh, will there be like, if gestures uh, are faulty, as you say, will there be like tools coming in the future, like a pen or a, like a pistol, if you want to play a shooting game? And is it also <laughs> is it possible to uh, like uh, draw a line uh, without a, a prefab uh, to enter into the the, the area? Uh, draw a line with uh, let's say I do a gesture like a pen and I want to draw my name yeah. is that possible to implement into the space yeah definitely so you can you can track you know the position of the hand or the position of any point uh, of your hand in 3d space so you can definitely draw with your fingertip if you want to um, in terms of accessories there's no accessories now for the whole lens uh, too it has Bluetooth capability so you can connect things to it. You can connect a mouse, a keyboard, uh, a gamepad uh, to do things like that. But there's no, um, say, 3D tracked uh, tools that are announced yet that will be tracked in 3D space. Uh, I don't know if any are, are coming. I know for the HoloLens 1, people have made accessories for the HoloLens 1 for specific uses like you're talking about, like a pen 
like a light pen that can be tracked in 3D space. Um, so I'm guessing they'll probably be available from third parties for the HoloLens uh, too. Um, but with gestures, I don't think it's such a much a problem of a problem with gestures. It's just more uh, a design approach that they want. Uh, they want the HoloLens 2 to be a device that you can not have to learn to use, that you already kind of instinctually know how to, to manipulate the holograms. Um, thanks for a good talk, by the way. Oh, thanks. Um, it seems to me that some of the issues with th this might be uh, in terms of graphical fidelity when the, the graphic in, uh, graphics pr uh, processing is done, being done by the headset itself, which most of VR headsets are plugged into a computer mm. and so on. Are there any possibilities to do that kind of thing if you, if you need more fidelity <coughs> um, yeah. to process graphics through a computer and then stream it to the headset or is things like that being done? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So, I mean, it, it, the HoloLens 2 is, is more powerful than the HoloLens 1, so you can do a, uh, a lot more on it than you could with the previous uh, version, but it is still, you know, it's a mobile device. It's not like a chunky gaming desktop. So there's things, yeah, there are performance limitations that you have to design around. But if you do want to uh, have like a, if you've got a high detail model that you absolutely have to render at uh, high fidelity. You've got the options of um, rendering it locally and streaming that to the, to the device wirelessly, or in the future, rendering it in the cloud in Azure and streaming that to the device as well. Um, so you've got those, those options. And still be able to use your, your input and your tracking in space. It does like uh, predictions on your head movement, so it uh, tries to look, uh, not look like a, like a video stream uh, as much as possible. Uh, so those are those are both options to to render locally on a local machine or to render in the cloud and stream it to the whole lens too. Uh, have you tried uh, the Hololens two yourself, and have you tried it outside? Because the original Hololens and the Magic Leap is pretty bad outside. Do you know anything about how? It yeah, works? sure. So I've um, yeah, so I've tried the the Hololens two. I haven't tried it outside. Uh, I've got a lot of experience with trying the whole, whole lens one outside because we did, uh, we've done projects where we're using it for visualizing outside and it has um, the, for the whole lens one, there's a couple of reasons it doesn't work. It's not that it's impossible to use outside. It just works less well outside uh, for two reasons. One is that the spaces are so huge outside that it's hard to grab onto things in the environment to work out where it is relative to those points. So if you've got a blank open field, it's hard for it to track itself in space. That's one problem that makes the tracking less reliable. The other problem is the display. Um, because it's got an uh, additive light display, it's adding uh, light into the lenses. So if you're in a very bright environment, like outside, that display is fighting against um, the outside light, and it's making the holograms seem, uh, seem dimmer and more transparent. Um, we've tried experimenting around that by having uh, film in front of the whole lens one, and that's uh, useful for some uh, use cases to make it more usable outside. For the whole lens too, I haven't tried it outside, but I've heard from Microsoft, I, I think it's still not necessarily intended uh, for outside for both those two reasons, but it should be better than the whole lens one um, at being used outside. Can you hear me from here? Yeah. I think there's a microphone. Uh... Uh, do we know anything about the price for HoloLens 2? Yeah, sure. So the price for the HoloLens 2 is uh, 3,500 US. Um, uh, the original HoloLens was 3,500 US for the development uh, version or 5,000 for the commercial version. So now there's only one version and one license. Um, so that's a, a, better, a better system. Um, so they've got, you can buy it outright for 3,500, or they also have a, a developer deal where you can pay 99 US per month uh, in order to get the whole lens, but also some for free Unity trials and um, a trial for Azure, or some Azure credits and a, a Pixie license as well, which is like a 3D conversion and management uh, software. So those are, those are the two options. But um, yeah, for, for, for Norway, since it's not part of the first wave, You'll have to wait until a, uh, another wave in order to use that developer by month uh, payment option.
All right. Uh, thanks for thanks for watching.